Welcome to New Possibilities. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Testing. All right, I see that I. Okay, I see that I'm online and everything. I see that this uh, Google Hangout has started. And I see that I have a couple of viewers. I'm going to wait a few minutes. If you all can let me know in the chat room if you can hear me OK, I would appreciate it. I'm still trying to get used to this Google Hangout system. Can you see my picture on the screen, Brittany? Brittany, can you see my picture? Okay, so one person said that they can see my, my image. Okay, so I'm going to get started. And what I'm going to do is just give a brief presentation, uh, tell you my thoughts about these issues. And then after that, I'm going to um, respond to a lot of your comments. And I may actually invite people to join the Google Hangout. So hopefully everything will go well. You know, I want to t thank the few people who have tuned in so far. We have about 10 viewers. You know, I want to thank you again. You know, I appreciate your support. I appreciate you for subscribing to my channel. There have uh, been some really significant developments right now that I feel the need to talk about all day. Today, I kept thinking about these various issues, about the killings, in Baton Rouge, about the killing in Minnesota, and about the killings in Dallas. So I'm going to talk about what happened in Dallas, the shootings in Dallas. And I see Constance here. Hello, thank you for joining. I see 83 NPAT here. Thank you for joining. I see Brittany Adams here. Thank you for joining and tuning into this program. So. We all know that last night there was a shooting in Dallas. 12 police officers were shot. Five of them were killed. Originally, the news report said that there were groups of snipers shooting at police officers. And this occurred during the Black Lives Matter demonstration. People were marching in the streets. They were demonstrating because of the horrific killings that took place. The killing of Alton Sterling, the killing of Philando uh, uh, Castile. The ki these killings were captured on videotape. So people have been outraged. They were marching in the streets, demonstrating, demanding justice for those brothers who were killed by police officers. And while they were marching and demonstrating, towards the end of the demonstration, gunfire broke out and 12 police officers were shot. Five of them were killed. And later it turns out that the actual or accused perpetrator, Makai Xavier Johnson, an African-American man, was responsible for this event. 
you know, that's according to news reports. They say that the police uh, used a robot with explosives to kill this man, Micah Xavier Johnson. They say that this man had on body armor. They say that he had an assault rifle. And according to the records, this uh, man was a member of the armed services. He was an army reservist. He had served for six years. He was a private first class. And apparently he was awarded the Army Achievement Award. According to news reports, he has no criminal record. He had no ties to any political groups or any terrorist groups. There are videos or photographs of him floating around online. There's an image of him in his um, army uniform. And there's also an image of him with a dashiki on, African beads, and his fists in the air uh, in the Black Power salute. And according to many people, he's a loner. So he's somebody that keeps to himself. But this whole situation raises a lot of questions for me. You know, I hear that a lot of people are crying out because these officers have died. You know, they're praying for the families. They're sending their condolences. And I understand that. I understand why people feel that way. And I have compassion for all human life. You know, I'm concerned about the plight of all human beings. But my problem is this. You know, people are crying for these police officers. People are expressing their sympathy for these police officers. But why don't people express the same kind of sympathy for black people when we lose our lives? When we are killed by these police, we don't get that kind of sympathy not from the mainstream society, not from these police officers. What these police officers often do is they get on programs and they try to justify and explain away the brutality that our people face. They try to rationalize these crimes that are committed against us. You know, they talk about how these brothers had guns on them. Or they say this person had a fear for their life. That's the popular phrase that they use, a fear for their life and their safety. And they use that to justify the killing of another black man. They dig up the criminal records of the victims. And they have the people believing that the actual victim is the criminal. They have people believing that the actual killer is the victim. That's how they use the media. And, you know, this whole killing just raises a lot of questions for me. You know, the timing is odd to me. Just when the nation was fixed on these two horrific incidents, when the nation was in a discussion about police brutality, when the nation was talking about Black Lives Mattering, all of a sudden you have this horrific event. All of a sudden, the conversation is no longer about justice for victims of police brutality. All of a sudden, the discussion is about the loss of these police officers' lives. And now what is happening is people are using this incident to discredit Black Lives Matter, to discredit the whole movement against police brutality. They are trying to link that shooting to Black Lives Matter and to all activists who fight against police brutality to suggest that somehow the activists condone this, to suggest somehow that the activists uh, violence when they don't. That protest was a peaceful protest until those shootings occurred. The man who was responsible for those shootings allegedly has no connection to Black Lives Matter. He's not a member of Black Lives Matter. He did not receive any kind of support from Black Lives Matter. But yet they want to tie this brother 
to Black Lives Matter, to tarnish Black Lives Matter, to discredit them, and to make them uh, ineffective, to neutralize what they are trying to do. And that's just wrong. That's fundamentally wrong. And there's nothing new about this. You know, there are examples of how uh, the federal government tried to discredit leaders like Martin Luther King, organizations like the Black Panther Party. They discredited them by putting agent provocateurs amongst the people. Like when Martin Luther King had a nonviolent march, if I'm not mistaken, he had a nonviolent march in Chicago. And what the government did is they planted agents among the marchers and they had the agents engage in acts of violence against property and people. And they thereby used those incidents to discredit King, to make him seem like he was disorganized, to make it seem like he was the cause of the violence. And, you know, this whole thing raises, you know, a question about conspiracy. Like, when I see something like this happen, I often think about a possible conspiracy. And I'm not one that's into conspiracy theories. As many people know, I'm not a conspiracy type of person. It needs hardcore evidence before I take a position on whether or not something is a conspiracy. But here, there are a lot of questions. I mean, it reminds me of that movie, The Manchurian Candidate, where they had soldiers that were subjected to mind control. And they engaged in all kinds of horrific acts. It reminds me of the DC sniper years ago. Many of these people that engage in these types of terroristic type of attacks, for some reason, a lot of them are affiliated with the military. I mean, and that can be for a variety of reasons. One being that people in military um, units have been trained to be killers. They have been programmed to kill. That may be part of it. But I just think that that coincidence just seems to be odd. You know, that this person happens to be a military person and when I heard about how this person or these suspects killed all those officers, I knew that that had to be a military person. That wasn't any kind of disorganized rebellion like what you saw in Ferguson or even here in Baltimore. It was clear and apparent that this person had a military mind, that this person knew what they were doing based on the efficiency that they were operating under. But again, you know, I have questions. You know, I have questions about the possibility of a conspiracy. You know, because they mentioned, like early news reports mentioned that there were multiple suspects. But yet, when the police um, killed this man, you know, they said that there was only one. And there are three other people that are in custody. Who are these people that are in custody? Why aren't they showing their faces or providing the public with their names? What are they hiding? That's what I want to know. They also said that um, this man, Mr. Johnson, wasn't affiliated with any group. But later, I saw a news report saying that he was a part of some group called the Black Power Political Organization, or that organization claimed responsibility for this act. And then there were news reports about him being a member of um, the new Black Panther Party. So there's a lot of conflicting reports. So I want to hear you know, the truth. I want to know what is going on. And there's so much information that we need to gather about this event. And, you know, I'm just curious, you know, I would like to know, like, what do you all think about what has occurred? What do you think about this man? You know, here we are 
in America, a country where there has been police brutality ever since the police have existed. Black people have been unfairly targeted, harassed, brutalized, and killed by these police. And often when black people are killed, the police are not indicted. The police are protected often. And the very few occasions where they are indicted, they usually get off. And nobody cries for the victims. As I said before, they rationalize what has happened. Nobody cries for us. Nobody cares for us. Nobody values our lives, but yet they want us to have compassion when police die, when police who have been terrorizing our community, when police who have been racially profiling us, brutalizing us and killing us, when they die, we're supposed to be sympathetic. We're supposed to shed tears when nobody cries for us. You know, I just I just think about a lot of things. You know, I I think about the hypocrisy of this society. You know, I think about President Obama, who said that this kind of violence is not acceptable. And I understand that. I mean, I understand why people would say that, you know, these officers in Dallas didn't have anything to do with those killings and Baton Rouge or the killing in Minneapolis and other killings in different places. I understand that. But these same people that say that there is no use for violence in society, these same people are some of the most violent people in history. They are waging war around the world right now. Invading countries, bombing countries, they use drones. And I was reading an article like not too long ago that where the government acknowledged that they killed over a hundred innocent people with these drones. And that's just the government's estimate. We know that probably far more people than that died. Far more people than that were killed in drone attacks. Far more people than that were killed in the invasions in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places around the world. So it's hard for me to take seriously people that want to attack Black people for defending themselves or for advocating self-defense. But yet these same people perpetuate violence around the world. These same people celebrate violence. You know, I, I heard President Obama celebrating the American Revolution. And I understand, you know, why any president would do so. But you can't celebrate the violence of the American Revolution and then condemn people for themselves and trying to survive in this world. You know, when I see what happened to this, when I see this story about this brother, Micah Johnson, you know, it just raises a question. I mean, do you all see him as a terrorist or do you see him as a modern day Nat Turner? And that's a serious question. I just wonder what people think about that. You know, I'm interested in your feedback because I'm sure that people probably saw Nat Turner as a terrorist when him and the rebels killed all those slave masters. They probably saw him as a terrorist at that time. But later on, people viewed him as a liberator. And I'm not necessarily saying that that's the case here, but I'm just curious as to what you think. You know, um, other people, they um, obtain their freedom through struggle. They don't obtain their freedom by singing We Shall Overcome, like Malcolm X has said. 
they don't obtain their freedom by passively accepting oppression. When you look at revolutions all around the world, you see that that's how people obtain their freedom. And Malcolm X said something, you know, that was profound. He said, the price for freedom is death. If you aren't prepared to fight for freedom, to sacrifice your very life, then you shouldn't even use the word freedom in your vocabulary. That's what Malcolm X said. And I'm not saying that this situation uh, involving this man, Micah Johnson, is on that kind of level or anything, or even that he's a freedom fighter. You know, he could be a very disturbed person. You know, many people in the military, they suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, and they have been taught to be violent, and they carry out violence on civilian populations. So this may not have anything to do with our struggle. And again, you know, I raised the question about whether or not this is deliberate, you know, whether or not this is some kind of conspiracy. Because here we are, you know, many people are no longer talking about Alton um, Sterling or Philando Castile. Now they're talking about what has happened in Dallas. So, you know, it just makes me wonder. That situation makes me think about that, you know, just about how this is being used to discredit the movement for justice, the movement against police brutality. And also they're using this to discredit um, the activist Professor Griff, because this brother, you know, Professor Griff actually took a picture with Micah Jones. I mean, Micah uh, Johnson, he took a picture with him. And now that picture is all over the internet and they're trying to suggest that Professor Griff is somehow tied to these acts of violence. They're using it to discredit him. And they're trying to like tear this brother down. So, you know, those are just some of my random thoughts about this, this whole situation. And, you know, I just want to, I want to talk about something else as well. I want to briefly mention another point. And that's this, um, a former Congressman, Joe Walsh from Illinois, you know, he's a Republican. He made a tweet, you know, on Twitter that has stirred a lot of discussion. He said three Dallas cops killed, seven wounded. You know, that's, that was the report at the time. So he said, this is now war. Watch out, Obama. Watch out, Black Lives Matter punks. Real America is coming after you. That's what he said. So essentially what this man is saying, you know, when he says real America, he's talking about white America. That's as real America. He's, this man is threatening the president of the United States. This man is threatening Black Lives Matter, a nonviolent organization. Obama has absolutely nothing to do with that shooting, obviously. Black Lives Matter had nothing to do with that shooting, obviously. But yet this man wants to blame them and he wants to threaten them. This is not some redneck. This is a politician, a former politician, somebody that was in Congress. You know, this is what this country is coming to. You know, and I, I really wonder about the future. I wonder what direction this country is gonna head after this incident. I wonder if there will be stepped up racial tensions in this country. I wonder if there will be incidents of violence in this country. I mean, as Constance says in the uh, comments section, I mean, 
this can incite war. There are militia groups all over this country, you know, that have been preparing for these types of events. They have been training in uh, survivalism. You know, they have been training and using assault rifles. They have been preparing for things like this. And one thing that's odd, you know, about this whole situation is that early on, I saw reports saying that the people that were responsible for these sniping incidents were white supremacists. That's what some early reports said. I don't know if those were false articles, but we don't know. We don't know who those three suspects are that they have in custody. You know, so these are frightening times that we live in right now. These are, um, you know, frightening times. I mean, it's like, not only do we have to worry about the police who kill us every other day with impunity, who kill us and they aren't indicted, they get away with it. So, I mean, I can understand somebody being enraged when they see that reality. I understand that full well. So we have the fear of police, and then we have these hate groups that are going to be inspired by this kind of rhetoric from a former congressman, a former congressman. This is the country we live in. You know, and I just think about how if there was a race war, what would happen to us as a people? We're not even prepared for anything on that kind of level. We can't even, we're not even effectively organizing as a people. Effectively organizing for simple reforms. If there was a race war, we would be wiped out because many of us don't know how to use um, weapons. We're not trained in how to survive off the land. We're not trained in guerrilla warfare. We are completely dependent on the white man for everything. We are dependent on him for food. We are dependent on him for electricity, for water. We are dependent on him for health care. You can't even get a a gun without getting it from a, a white company that makes the guns or the bullets from, you know, a white man that manufactures the bullets. So that just makes me wonder, like, how would we make it if there was an actual race war? You have these people online talking all this race war rhetoric. And that just makes me wonder about these people to talk like this. It makes me wonder who they are working for. Are they working for the people or are they working for somebody else? You know, they said some group claimed responsibility, as I said earlier, for this uh, shooting that happened in Dallas. That's what they say. I mean, if somebody was really about committing those kind of acts in America, they would have to be out of their mind to admit or claim responsibility for that. They would have to be crazy to do so. In this information age where they can track people down, they can track you down. If they can track terrorists down all the way in Afghanistan, all the way in Iraq, and drop bombs on them, then what do that you think they're gonna do to your black ass? They blew this man up. They used the robot to blow this man up. You know, there are such thing as agent provocateurs, people that encourage people to engage in violence or encourage them to violate the law to set them up for destruction. And I think that some of these people may may be serving that purpose. 
you know, these are just random thoughts that are coming to my mind. I'm just flowing with it. You know, it's not like structured. You know, I have some notes here, but I just have a lot of things on my mind. And if anybody is um, interested in joining the discussion, you know, I may um, share the link. So I'm going to look through your comments and uh, respond to some of the comments that were left. Just give me a second, please bear with me. Yeah, so Constant Poetry said, we live in an unjust world. We may never experience that kind of sympathy due to the climate. And, you know, that's, that's true. I mean, you know, this is a country that had no problem enslaving us. This is a country that had no problem committing genocide against the Native people. This is a country that had no problem segregating Black people lynching black people, oppressing black people, and exploiting black people. For us to sit around waiting for them to be sympathetic, you know, that's a, a foolish endeavor. For us to try to appeal to their conscience, that's a waste of time. You know, as uh, Frederick Douglass said, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. And the only way we can affect change is through organization, through applying pressure and through agitation and through struggle. We didn't get the few civil rights that we have today based on the kindness of somebody's heart. Our people had to struggle. Our people had to fight. Our people had to bleed. Our people had to die. So yeah, I mean, we, we can't sit around waiting for sympathy in this kind of environment where these people have shown that they have no regard for our lives. I mean, we're being killed live on camera and nothing happens about it. You had Eric Garner choked to death on camera and nothing happened. Live on camera and the police walk. I mean, how long will this continue before there's a change? Okay, and earlier I asked the question whether or not people see this guy, um, Micah Johnson, as a hero. And I see that the cure says that, honestly, um, people don't see him that way. Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, and it's, it's hard to see somebody that commits this kind of atrocity against some random police officers as a hero. I mean, because when you think about it, what, has, what did he really accomplish? How is shooting five police officers going to end police brutality? When you think about it in the big scheme of things. It doesn't change the situation. In fact, it undermines the cause because now people are using that to discredit the movement. Even if we reflect on the Black Panther Party, the original Black Panthers, I'm not talking about those fake Black Panthers. I'm talking about the original Black Panthers. When we look at them, they stood up to the police. They are an example of courage. But what happened when they stood up to the police? Many Black Panthers were killed. Many Black Panthers were jailed. The Black Panthers were destroyed by the government. And police brutality continued. This is a long-term struggle. You know, there's not going to be any kind of easy answers to the problem. Even when you go through the system, you know, you can file lawsuits that may create some change in a particular police department. 
attorneys that represent families where somebody has been killed by the police. Those attorneys may recover millions of dollars for that particular family, but they don't change the conditions that our people face. They don't change the practices of these police departments. They don't stop the racial profiling. They don't stop the police brutality against the next citizen. That only compensates that particular family. And then you have situations where you have the Justice Department come in and they may make some reforms and there may be some temporary um, easing of tensions or resolutions of some issues. But then a few years later, the cycle repeats itself. So this is a protracted struggle. It's not something that's gonna be cured overnight. There is no silver bullet. You know, and I hear people like Madhead, they complain about, black people complaining about the problem. They say, well, why aren't you providing any kind of solutions and all that kind of stuff instead of just talking about the problem or the causes and all that kind of stuff. And that's a legitimate question. I mean, the problem is that this, problem doesn't have any kind of easy answers. If it had easy answers, we would have solved it a long time ago. But I think the very first thing that we can do as a people, each and every one of us right now can do is join an organization that's fighting for your people. As I said on the last stream, the brother Kwame Toure said, we have to be organized if we want to make a difference whether that's joining you know, your community neighborhood group or joining some political group, joining Black Lives Matter, joining uh, some other organization that's trying to fight to improve our situation. That's what we need to do. You know, often we read about the civil rights movement. We read about what happened back then and we talk about you know, how we wish, some of us talk about how we wished we lived during those times so that we could fight for justice and stand up. Well, that time is right now. The time for civil rights struggle is now. It's in our hands. We got to take action now. All right, so I'm going to read a few more comments. All right, I see that 83N Pat said, you know, when a lion has stopped, when has a lion stopped hunting a gazelle because it caused pain? Never. Simply asking will not work. Only a lion can stop a lion. Only a hunter can stop a hunter. Only fire can stop fire. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a valid point. You know, too often, we are the prey and they are the hunter. And, you know, I don't condone like random acts of violence, like what this man engaged in effective. And I think that, you know, all that does is throw um, fuel on the fire. It doesn't solve the problem. But I do believe in the right to self-defense. I do believe that, you know, the days of us just sitting around being killed and being victims needs to end. We have a legal right to defend ourselves. We have a moral duty to defend ourselves. That's how people survive. That's how any intelligent group of people conducts their business. They protect themselves and they protect them and in their interests. And it's time for us to do so. Now, Mad had said something about um, Malcolm X. He said, Malcolm X said things like that. Yeah. Now, you know, that's, that's an interesting point. You know, I could say, you know, I'll say this. The nation of Islam, you know, despite their their um, rhetoric about self-defense and all that kind of stuff, they did not put that into action when it comes to 
the people that they call devils and all that kind of stuff. You know, there were incidents in um, Los Angeles where members of the nation were attacked. And there were other incidents of police brutality. Instead of like retaliating, like people um, such as Malcolm X encouraged or wanted to retaliate, you know, they basically um, did not retaliate. And actually Elijah Muhammad spoke out against armed struggle or, or um, you know, some kind of armed defense. And instead, you know, they did what they accused the Christians of doing, waiting around for what they call a mystery God to save them, waiting around for somebody in a spaceship in what they call a mothership to come save them. So, I mean, that's a valid point. But I think that when Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, he was actually serious about defending Black people. And I think that he always had that intention, but he had restraints on him because he wasn't the, the main uh, leader of the Nation of Islam. The main leader of the Nation of Islam was Elijah Muhammad. And when Malcolm X talked about actually defending civil rights workers, you know, protecting them with arms, that's when they had to take him out. Well, he did defend his household. He had a gun and he was ready to shoot those people that bombed his house. So it's not entirely accurate to say that Malcolm X didn't do some of the things. You know, Malcolm X was snuffed out before he had an opportunity to f fully live out, you know, a lot of the things that he espoused. So I'm going to keep looking through the comments. Yeah, and I see the cure um, said that they used his black body, and I assume that she's talking about um, Mr. Johnson, to further their imperialistic goals. They don't care about our veterans' minds. And, you know, sadly, that's true. I mean, they, they give you this rhetoric of, of uh, patriotism. They give you this rhetoric of, about democracy and promoting freedom around the world when really these people are fighting and dying for corporations. That's what they're doing. They're not fighting for the people. You know, they're not fighting for democracy. They're fighting for resources. They're fighting to preserve and protect and promote the interests of the ruling elite in this country. And, you know, it's, that's just the reality of it. And frankly, I can't understand how any black man or woman, for that matter, would serve in the United States Army. You know, fighting abroad for freedoms that we, we don't even have here. You know, our people have been fighting in all of America's wars, dying in all of America's wars. And they, we come back home and we're still you know, second-class citizens, despite the progress that we've made, you still have these incidents like, you know, Alton um, Sterling and the brother Philando Castile. This problem continues for a long time. I mean, I, I remember over 20 years ago when Rodney King was beaten like a slave, live on camera. And I thought that that was, you know, an unusual occurrence. I thought that that was something that um, was rare, you know, and here we are all these years later and the same type of things occur now. The only difference is now we have the technology to capture these types of incidents. And I see that Dante says violence don't solve anything. Um,
tell that to the United States government when they decided to retaliate after 9-11, when they decided to invade Iraq and Afghanistan, when they continue to drop bombs on people right now. You know, my, um, Obama came into office on the promise of bringing about peace, you know, ending war and all that kind of stuff. But as he leaves, there are still troops in Afghanistan right now. They're being dropped in Iraq and other places. If violence doesn't solve anything, like, just think, I mean, they, this country gained its independence through an American revolution. You know, countries like Cuba and China and all these countries around the world, they gained their freedom through armed struggle, through violence. So I, I think that it's um, like simplistic to say that violence doesn't solve anything. Um, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, like, especially in this example, like shooting those five police and, you know, 12 police officers and killing five, that solved nothing. That brother lost his life. That didn't stop police brutality from occurring. The beast continues to march on. I'm gonna keep reading through um, some of the comments. I see that Constance said, um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spirits and principalities. You know, that's uh, scripture. You know, there is a, a war, you know, a spiritual war going on as well. You know, there's a spirit of wickedness in this country when you see what's occurring, you know, the violence. You know, you know concerned about the future of this country right now. You know, I'm concerned about the direction of this country. You know, once Obama leaves, who knows what direction this country is going to go in. We don't know if we're going to have Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And both of those candidates are inclined towards war. You know, both of those candidates had their negatives. And just when you look at the racial climate in this country, it doesn't give you reason to be optimistic. I see that the cure says that the the church and mosque need to be utilized in order to organize. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, a lot of churches are a part of the struggle. You know, a lot of churches um, are actively involved in our people's struggle. You know, they work with uh, movements of today. And the same is true for some mosques, but I think that they need to step it up. You know, too often religious institutions are more concerned about the hereafter, you know, the afterlife than they are concerned about this life. And we need to be concerned, you know, for those who believe we need to be seeking the good in this life and the good in the hereafter. We need to make this world a better place. And, you know, the church should play that kind of role in our community. There's no reason why you can have these cathedrals, these monuments that um, are surrounded by wastelands, that are surrounded by hopelessness. So definitely a role for the church.
So I see that the cure said Al Sharpton had some very poignant things to say with the National Action uh, Network. Um, let's see. So I'll probably read later um, exactly what he said. So let me ask Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me now? I see that the mic is lighting up when I talk. So if you all can let me, okay, you can hear, okay, good. 
All right, I think I pressed my uh, mute button on my on my headphones. Okay, good. Okay, I think that if somebody is interested in joining the discussion, like, um, you know, joining the hangout, uh, just let me know and I may just put the link in the comments section. So if somebody would like to join, you can let me know and I'll I'll put the link in the comment section. Again, if you want to join the conversation. Okay, I'm going to try to do this. Uh, this is my first time doing this, so bear with me. Um, Okay, because uh, I want to hear what you all have to say. Just keep it respectful. <laughs> all right. I think that's how you do it. That's the link. So somebody wants to join. But I want to thank, you know, everybody for participating, you know, for your comments. Eventually, I'll get the hang of this, this Google Hangout thing. <laughs> but I appreciate you all for sticking in there. So I'll wait a couple of minutes. If nobody joins, then I can, I'll close this out. All right, well, I, I want to thank everybody for joining the discussion. You know, um, you know, I look forward to hearing from people who haven't um, participated in this uh, discussion in the comment section. Um, so tell me what you think. Hi. Uh oh, somebody, did somebody just join? Yes, it's me, <laughs> curious. Oh, hi, <laughs> how are you doing? Well, I could certainly be better. How are you? Good, good. I appreciate the invite. I know it was a risk. Um, so what do you have to say about this whole issue? Well, when it comes to Micah, Xavier Johnson, I just feel like at this point there's so much distrust of police. I'm not sure what was expected. And there's also distrust of media outlets. Um, there are many who are questioning the validity of claims made by the press. I see that so, his sister, uh-huh. So what claims, um, are there claims that you um, distrust from the press, like dealing with this whole um, shooting and- Well, uh, it was weird how they had just so many suspects released to the news but i do know that the first black man that they thought did it you know he came forward what was it he said i took a screenshot of what he said it was yeah he said okay the first man mark hughes says that they lied and said they had video of me shooting he was spotted uh with assault rifle at protest was not one of the snipers who killed five police officers. Yeah, they, they lied on him. And he says, I can't believe it. In hindsight, with 2020, I could have easily been shot. Right, right. Wow. 
His brother, Corey, said he brought the gun to exercise his Second Amendment right to bear arms. I don't know if this person just doesn't know that they're black, but you cannot walk around. We don't have Second Amendment rights, okay? We can't even have a water gun. And, um, right, and I mean, if you look at what happened to uh, Tamir Rice, you know, it's clear that they don't see us as having the right to bear arms at all. Well, who's a 12-year-old? Yeah, a 12-year-old with a toy gun, they arrived on a scene and killed him within seconds. That, so, he looks you know, like a 12-year-old, though. I can't even understand that. Right, it's like, obviously, they, they don't see us as being equal. They don't see that we have the right to bear arms like any other citizen. I saw a video on um, YouTube not too long ago where they showed two different men carrying the same weapon in public in an open carry state. And the police had two completely different reactions to him. One was white and one was black. The white man just had a conversation with the police officer. They politely asked him why he had the gun. And, you know, they engaged him in a discussion. But the black man that was walking down the street, immediately the police officer pulled his car over, jumped out and pointed his gun at this man and told him to get on the ground uh, as if it was some kind of emergency. I mean, we don't have the same rights in this country. I mean, when black people in California uh, back in the 60s picked up guns to defend themselves, to stand up to the police, all of a sudden, the California state wanted to ban the right to open carry and all that kind of stuff. It's definitely a double standard. So you mean to tell me that there could be gun control occurring now? I mean, because maybe it would be a fringe benefit, honestly, because they have to tighten something up. Um, I thought gun control meant taking people's guns away. I didn't realize how easy it was to get a gun. You don't have to have any safety training here compared to many other countries. You don't have to have a safe place to store your weapon here. Again, compared to many other countries, you don't have to have a license. You don't have to give a reason for why you need that gun. And um, at this point, it scares me. I, I feel scared. And when people say, oh, you're scared, you should get a gun. I don't know what to say. I don't feel comfortable with a gun. Right. I'm just not somebody who wants to carry. In fact, I have a toy... Um, gun that shocks you when you shoot it and it shoots flame. I don't feel comfortable with that. I was scared to take that out of the convenience store. I feel like it could easily happen to somebody that I know, somebody that I love. Right. Um, I live in a white area and I'm afraid to go out after certain times now seeing this kind of activity. I'm afraid of what somebody may do to me. Right. And I never thought I would be living like this. You have to understand when you're in, you know, white schools, oh, slavery is over. It's okay. Don't worry. It's all right. I mean, this young man went to serve his country only to come back and find that somebody younger than him was hanging from a tree. Somebody with his complexion. He came back after serving his country to find that a handicapped black boy was sodomized by two white teenagers. And that I didn't hear about that. What happened? Um, did you? I didn't hear about this. Oh, yeah. Did you hear a little bit about it? No, not, I didn't hear about that at all. Okay, well, it was basically a situation where there was a a white family, I guess, at least a white woman, had adopted two black children, and I guess there was racial tension. Those two white, I believe they were teenagers, they were at least in high school or middle school, I believe it was high school, they sodomized him with um, a coat hanger. If you're living in America and you come back to see that kind of crime go unchecked, well, you know, the town responded horribly. The town is um, attacking that family. They're, there's, there's not sympathy there. Mm -hmm. 
they're they're um they're in a racist environment. If you come back to that, what are you supposed to think? What are you what are you supposed to think? You see stories like that, then you see videos of video after video of black people being shot down. Not one time, not two times, but they have a need to shoot our corpses. To just take every bit of our spirit. It's I, I can't understand it. Um I don't know what is expected of black service people, black police officers, um, black Navy veterans, black Marine veterans, black Army veterans, when they go to serve and then come back to this. Not only do you have to fight to serve, but you have to fight for this. I mean, you have to fight this. And I think that it's devastating absolutely devastating. I can see how something like this can happen. In fact, I am surprised it did not happen sooner. I am absolutely shocked. In fact, we're going, I thought that um, something like this would never happen. Right. You know, because it, it hasn't happened before. It really hasn't. And when I look at what white police officers are doing to black people, and I think about that, I'm 24 now, just turned 24. And I think uh, Rodney King happened when I was about one years old, one year old. And the same kinds of things are happening, and the response appears to be similar. That's insane. What is changing? So what, what is changing? Think, what do you think the answer is to um, the problem of police brutality? No. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. You probably want to go to your control panel right here on the left side of your Hangouts browser and um, click the control box and turn your volume up. Okay, control box. Uh, you said that's on the right? Mm -hmm. so. No? Yeah. Can you hear me better now? I like it a little louder because my MacBook is only one away from it being the loudest and it still is kind of a whisper. Okay. And I can feel like me? the people there yeah. can, yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so I was asking. Yeah, so I was asking. Oh, I hear an echo now. Um, do you have your volume on your computer? Hello? Did somebody else join? Let's see. Yeah, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, I don't hear it now. Is it gone? I turned my volume down. That might have helped. Okay. Yeah, I don't hear it now. So okay. what do you think the answer is to uh, police brutality? You know what? I think that there are going to be multiple answers. And I think that that is something that people don't necessarily want to admit. The same goes for gun control. There are going to be multiple answers because we have multiple issues um, that are mixing in. We have officers who are trigger happy, that are scared, that are dealing with PTSD, that should some should never be on the force. Some are not getting mental health help. In addition, we're dealing with a population that is not getting mental health services either. We're seeing people that could have very easily been 5150 and taken to a hospital, ending up losing their lives. These are the kinds of people that need to um, go in and get help. People that can be rehabilitated. Officers are not trained or prepared in dealing with that. Um, in addition, I second what Reverend Al Sharpton has to say with the National Action, um, is it the yeah. National a uh, Action Network? Right, right. Yeah, I saw your comment. So what did Al Sharpton say? Okay, well, I have it, I have brought it up. I don't want to misquote him, but so many people dismiss this man as a figurehead. I think it's important to know he has an organization 
And um, while what he does is in the public eye and nobody's going to like it, no one likes when somebody is around to hold accountability, um, you have to realize that this person also has some very good points. Okay, yes, National Action Network. Here's what I'll have to say. For years, organizations like my National Action Network have pushed for accountability and reform across the board. We have repeatedly stated that the problem is not isolated. It's not a Louisiana problem. It's not a Minnesota problem. It's not a Staten Island problem. It's a national problem that requires national reform of police culture and the criminal justice system itself. Nothing short of that will turn this calamity around. We must have independent investigations and prosecutions so that police are held accountable by an objective neutral entity. And the community is assured that there isn't even an appearance of a conflict of interest. Officers cannot be investigated by those that they interact with on a daily or regular basis. That is common sense. Secondarily, there must be extensive training and residency requirements that police live in the cities that they serve. That is the only way that they will respect and treat that community fairly. So that is what Al had to say. What do you think, Mr. Possibilities? Yeah, I think that, uh, um, you know, those are obviously like strong comments. You know, I think that those types of um, measures are good in terms of after, you know, one of these um, incidents occurs. But I think that we need to have some kind of uh, solution that will prevent the incidents from occurring in the first place. Um, because that deals with after a police shooting, you know, after another black man is dead. You know, and I think that it's important, well, I mm -hmm. obviously, to get justice for people that have been victimized by police brutality, but we need to get to the point where we no longer have people being victimized by police brutality. We no longer have racial profiling. We need to look at measures well, to, to deal with that aspect on the front end instead of dealing with it solely on the back end. But those are, you know, very important measures that I agree with. You know, I agree that they need to have special prosecutors who are independent, who aren't tied to the police structure. Um, you know, because a lot of these policies, um, prosecutors, they rely on the police because they regularly bring criminal cases where they need the police to testify. They work with the police all the time. They um, have the same interests as the police. They are tied to the police. They have a symbiotic type of relationship with the police. So it's very difficult to actually expect these prosecutors to do something about the problems that, uh, of police brutality. You know, you have rare situations like here in Baltimore where our state's attorney has had the courage to stand up and bring charges against officers, but that's rare. Rarely do they have that kind of courage. They're usually intimidated by the police. Yeah, well, I feel like... Hello? You're cutting oh, up. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I can hear. Yeah, you're you're breaking up. Okay, one second. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. I hear you. Time to circle the wagons. Can you hear me? Um, am I buffering? Oh, I see Curious is off. I'm going to type something. Um, can you hear me? Can people hear me? OK, I'm going to post the link again to um, the Hangout just in case people want to join the discussion. I see uh, True Royal Family is here. You know, I like your content on your channel. You know, thanks for joining the, um, the chat. Uh, so I'll post the link here. 
in case people want to join other people. Um, yes. Curious, are you back? You're, okay. Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry so about the saying, disruption. Oh, no mm -hmm. problem. So you were saying something? Yes, I feel like at this point, we have so many people who never got justice. Um, and I think that's a lot of why it's a problem that these people are able to walk free and walk our communities again. Maybe not necessarily in the capacity of officers, although oftentimes they do. Um, but that they're just able to walk free without any kind of any kind of behavioral intervention. That they're able to do the same harm to another family of color, right? And, and cause the same intimidation. That when one goes free, it sends a message to all of them that they can continue forth. It's a vicious cycle, and right, the right. reality is that when they. Right. You know, I agree because like here in Baltimore, we have this Freddie Gray trial going on and two of the officers have um, been found not guilty and they're still entitled to continue to serve as police officers. Um, you have the situation of uh, George Zimmerman, even though he's not a police officer or anything like that, he was a wannabe police officer. This man is walking around free today. This man continues to taunt uh, Trayvon Martin's family. You know, this man has actually become a celebrity. He has profited off of the death of Trayvon Martin. He sold his, um, the gun that he used to kill Trayvon Martin for over $100,000 from what I remember. Um, and it's just a slap in the face to the family. So, you know, as I said before, it's like when people don't show us any kind of respect or any kind of regard, they don't show any compassion for black people. It's hard for us to have compassion for others, especially police when yes. police, police are the ones to kill us often. I mean, they're the ones who harass our communities. So it's just a sad situation. I mean, it's an outrageous situation when these, these police walk free. I think there's a difference between compassion and subservient um, abuse enabling uh, sponsoring our own abuse. I think that black people have been very compassionate. I don't really necessarily feel like our compassion is the problem. I think that people taking advantage is the problem and I think that a lack of defense. I think right. that yeah. I was talking perhaps, about like I was talking about mainstream, the mainstream society. The mainstream society. Oh, I Okay, I've turned my phone. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Since, uh, look, from, from young, when we look at statistics, uh, white children do not have the same sympathy towards black children when they are harmed as they do towards white children. This is something that is innate in our culture. When we look at Dylan Roof and we look at Micah Johnson. These people were created by our society, by and large. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that they would have even needed mental illness to necessarily do the things that they did. We're living in an environment where there is cult-like racism in some parts of this country, like where Dylan Roof was. There's enabling, there's a culture there. And it tills the soil for mass black shootings for black people to be hunted like animals and then in addition you have black service people serving this country only to be you know to basically receive spit in their face by the kinds of things that are going on to their loved ones while they're away serving i i can't imagine what was to be expected with what the climate is for black people in America. 136 black people were killed this year by police. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, 29 police officers have been killed this year. Um, 29. Right. And I don't even know if that was all by gunfire of those, of those 29 that were killed. The way that the white police were going about it, I really thought that 
that they had a much higher risk. I thought that they were dying daily. I had no idea that more civilians were dying than police. I had no idea. I thought that, that the risk was, was very high. I'm floored. And, and I, what's, I really what's your source for these um, stats so I could look it up you know, later on? There's a website I had and send you the link. And also, I know you probably know that um, Beyonce had a letter that she wrote, and she also included a link to writing our local Congress people, uh -huh. which I do think is important. I don't have a problem writing my local officials or my congressman or woman to let them know how I feel scared in my own home. I really don't. So what do you think about the role of celebrities? So, um, what do you think about the role of celebrities in this fight for social justice, you know, this fight against police brutality and all that? Like, I know that Beyonce had a song formation and mm -hmm. Kendrick Lamar has had some um, political songs that have caused a lot of discussion. What do you think about that? What do you think about the role of artists in this struggle? Well, I think that uh, when I think of songs like A Change Is Gonna Come, I listened to that after I saw the Orlando Massacre. And it, it really moved me. It's very easy to become desensitized and music can really touch people in a spiritual way. However, when I see artists merging their own uh, capitalist fuel greed, sorry, capital, capitalistic, feel greed, um, and doing all kinds of other things uh -huh. in that same music, those same songs, I'm kind of confused. You know, I understand that sometimes art is singing a story that isn't yours, uh -huh. but we have rappers who were literally pretending that they were about that life when they never were. I think it would be it would be not, it would be nice to lived it could actually tell their own stories but i do appreciate um that beyonce shared these links um and that she wrote her letter it sounded really heartfelt uh -huh. i'm pretty sure she's sick of seeing it can you imagine uh being a celebrity being successful like this within a white structure and thinking gee I have all of this money and they are still doing this to my people. Right. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that I, I wouldn't be very, very angry. Right. I think I would be living. So I saw some of your comments about. So um, I saw some of your comments. About, uh oh, I hear an echo again. Um, yeah, so I saw your comments about um, yeah, so Micah comments. Johnson. What do you think about Michael that situation? You, you said a few things that. about it, but I, I want to know like more about what you think about. About what occurred and what kind of do you how do you see this man i'm not gonna lie to you when i saw this person after uh after seeing you have to understand black people are desensitized by and large to serious serious violence we feel like no one cares no nothing is ever going to happen to police who are enacting violence um, we have situations where down south, we have uh, officers going into prisons and raping the women. Women can't do anything. No one hears our screams. And it seems like things were just becoming more public. Like I said, with that lynching in New Orleans, uh -huh. with, with the shooting that occurred where the man was on the ground. There was no reason, no reason. People being killed in front of their kids. Um, and the, the horrible, horrible response from white people. I think that if there was solidarity, and I understand that there are allies, there are, and it's been very helpful. But by and large, there's been an immediate attack on black people. And we have people who are literally scared of of, of people of color um, and feel that 
us having our rights means that they've got to lose theirs. I think that for, for somebody who's a veteran, for somebody who served this country, to come back and see a situation like this, they don't, they don't pick any, just anybody to serve. Um, this is somebody who was born to fight. Mm -hmm. And he sees his people being attacked. I don't know what's to be expected. I really don't. I'm really shocked that it took this long and that it even happened at all. Um, when I saw him there in his uniform, and I see that he's only 25, it's devastating. It's devastating that somebody my own age saw this white racism and put their life on the line. He lost his life for something that he believed in. It wasn't a joke for him. It wasn't made up racism. It's something that was very real for him to the extent that he was willing to lose his life. Um, I don't know if mental health issues were involved. He, he, I heard that he was a recluse. He probably wasn't getting out as much. Um, and I think that when you have this kind of climate, this hostility towards a mar uh, marginalized group, people have to seek support. People have to seek emotional support and we also have to take breaks. And I want anyone who's out there listening or who may be uh, thinking that this is the cool thing to do, understand that there are people who love you. You may have a sister, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, who would rather just have you here, and the black community would rather have you here than um, assaulting police and losing your life. That was the end of what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for okay. joining the, the Hangout. Um, you know, I appreciate your, your commentary and, you know, your comments and everything. Thanks, and I, I plan on having future Hangouts, and you know, I look forward to you joining those as well. Thank you. I'm going to get you these links, though. Um, the Guardian is tracking the number of assaults. Um, I think that at this point, it's time to acknowledge our cultural roles when it comes to both Micah Johnson and Dylan Roof and how we really bred these people. Um, I, see, I see literally white people in Texas who are calling Texas, they're calling it Tachistan. Okay, they're they're calling the, the Christian Republicans in Texas the terrorists. So it's not just black people. Right. Um, but beyond that, I would like to share this link with you because it is nice. You can separate by race, by gender, by area and see how many people have been killed this year. It's put on by The Guardian, which is a news. It's, it's a press site. I, I will admit that, but it, it really does help. I was surprised at the number of white women killed by police, and it seems like in those situations, oftentimes, it's a white male police officer who comes home and shoots his wife. It's an issue of domestic violence. Um, there's also an, uh, an issue with misogyny in that area. It's not like female police officers are shooting and beating people to death. Right. So, again, thank you so much, Mr. Possibilities, for having me on, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And I appreciate you joining. Um, so I look forward to hearing you on other um, hangouts and everything. I see that somebody left a comment. I just want to respond to them briefly. Uh, one Southside player said, all these fake pro-black sites are quiet now. Uh, he said, all Negroes want our speeches, but when somebody stands up, now they want everybody to sit down. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in hearing, like, yeah, I hear your echo from, uh, I hear echo. I've muted myself. Okay. okay. I'm being quiet. 
<laughs> I'm going to hang up so I can hear from the live stream. But thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right. So I'm going to. So one Southside player, you know, I see that you have a lot of comments here. You know, you're making some controversial statements. You know, if you're interested in joining this Google Hangout, you know, I'll post the link again, or you can go to the link and, um, you know, and join the Hangout so I can hear you live, hear your comments live. Because I hear a lot of people talking, you know, a lot of things, but, you know, they rarely um, show their face. And I don't know if you have a, a channel where you actually leave content or if you just make comments on people's videos, but I would be interested in hearing what you have to say about this issue. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to post this link one more time, just in case you're interested in joining the discussion. One second. And I want to thank Curious again for joining the discussion earlier. I appreciate it. Okay, and now I guess one side, uh, South Side player said, we don't show our face because we understand that people are recording and watching. Well, you could show your image. You have, I mean, your um, icon is up there now in the comment section. So, um, you know, if you can show it in the comment section, I, I just wonder why you can't show it in the Hangout. I mean, it's easy to talk a lot of stuff, you know, by typing, but it's another thing to actually speak up and say your piece. You know, anybody can type, you know, bold statements, but it's quite another thing to stand behind your statements by putting a face with the words. Um, the icon that I have for my channel is my actual face. You know, I actually, you know, lately I've been doing a lot of videos without showing my face, but I have shown my face a lot of times because you know, I stand behind everything that I say here on YouTube. I stand behind it 100%. You know, what I say on YouTube is something that I'll say in the presence of anybody. And I think that people, if they want to be taken seriously, they need to be willing to, to stand behind their statements. Because anybody can type something in a comment section or in a chat room talking about, you know, encouraging, um, revolutionary action or armed struggle and all that kind of stuff. For all we, we know, you could be anybody. I mean, you could be the government, you know, an agent provocateur. And, you know, I'm not asking, you, you said um, you don't tell your war plans. I'm not asking you to tell your war plans. I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from uh, because you're basically saying that you agree with what this man did and you know, in an indirect kind of way. And you're saying that people are wrong for condemning this man. And I'm interested in knowing what, what websites are you talking about? You said a lot of pro-black websites are silent right now. Um, and I just wonder, you know, who you're talking about. Name the names, you know. Um, but I won't insist, you know, I see that you, you're not willing to speak out um, you would just rather comment in the comment section, and that's cool. But with that, I'm going to close out. You know, I may do another uh, Google Hangout um, maybe this weekend or early next week. I'm going to try to have a regular day when I do these Hangouts so that people will know when to expect a Hangout. But with that, I'll just say peace. And, you know, I want to thank everybody for joining uh, this Hangout and, you know, checking it out and participate. Peace.